Today we're going to start a series on the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Now we're going to look at it from a historical as well as a theological and biblical perspective along the way. Recently I heard a somewhat uh, noted church historian remark that the Reformation is over, that the battle that was so vicious in the 16th century in the rise of Protestantism has so <clears throat> cooled off since that time that no longer is there any need for ongoing debate on a doctrine such as justification by faith alone. We know, for example, that in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation, the church experienced the deepest fracture in her entire history and that the battle became so acrimonious that after the split occurred between Rome and Protestantism, the retaliation between both sides became uh, bloody at times. The only time I can think of of a monarch in England having the nickname Bloody was Bloody Mary when she tried to restore Catholicism to England and engaged in radical persecution against those who fled from her uh, uh, persecutions to other nations. But we know that people were tortured, they were beaten, and they were killed because the issue seemed to be to those contemporaries involved in the dispute of the 16th century to be of the utmost magnitude, indeed a doctrinal controversy that had to do with eternal consequences. Now the church has always had to deal with controversy and with division and with debates about theology, some more serious than others. But we go back to the fourth century and we think of the <clears throat> significant controversy with Arius who denied the deity of Christ and that led to the Council of Nicaea and subsequently the Nicene Creed. Then we move to the fifth century and the church's struggle with Eutyches and whose monophysite heresy was so destructive along with Nestorius and it led to the Council of Chalcedon where we've got the, the most complete definition of the church's understanding of the person of Jesus formulated at that time. But those controversies as profound as they were back in the fourth and fifth century almost pale into insignificance when we think of what happened in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation. Now, as we will see as we go along, Luther considered the issue of justification to be so significant and so important that he was willing that the church be rent asunder for the sake of the salvation of those people who were not hearing the gospel. You recall if you go to Switzerland today and go to the old town of Geneva and the Reformation Park, there's this massive wall across the side of the uh, uh, amphitheater there and with the statues of men like Calvin and Beza and Luther and Zwingli and Knox and other people that were prominently involved in the 16th century Reformation, but chiseled into the stone of the Reformation wall are the Latin words post tenebras lux, after darkness, light. Luther was convinced that the gospel itself had fallen into darkness and obscurity in the late Middle Ages during a period of unprecedented corruption uh, in the church. And <clears throat> the Reformation, from his perspective, was the recapturing and recovering of nothing less than the gospel itself. It was the gospel that had been hidden under the machinations of the uh, uh, liturgies of the church of the Middle Ages 
And this is what Luther was concerned to repair, to bring the gospel into the forefront so that the light of the gospel could shine anew in the life of the church. At, uh, at one point, for example, when the, as a secondary matter of debate with the church over the question of whether or not the Bible should be allowed to be read by people apart from the interpretation of the church, the church said, if you let people read the Bible in their own language, for example, and read it for themselves, this will open a floodgate of iniquity. And many, many, many churches will rise up, each claiming to have the Bible as their authoritative support. And of course, since that warning was issued to Luther almost 500 years ago, there have been over 2,000 Protestant denominations spring up in, in, in the world, each claiming to be the true biblical church, as it were. So Luther was aware that that could happen. But he said that the, the gospel is so plain in Scripture that a child can understand it. And to keep that message of the gospel away from people was inexcusable. And so he simply demanded that the Bible be made available for everyone so that they can hear and understand and learn the gospel. And so he replied to the church, if a floodgate of iniquity be opened, so be it. I mean, you have to ask the question of the psychology of Luther, his mentality, how he was able to stand against the whole world of, of, of his day insisting on this particular doctrine of justification by faith alone. He made the famous statement that the doctrine of justification by faith alone is the article upon which the church stands or falls. And the article that is so important that he said that if we lose it, we lose Christianity. He said justification by faith alone is the prince, the Lord, the uh, authority for all else that comes to us out of sacred scripture. Again, going back to the motto, it's the article upon which the church stands or falls. What did he mean by that? He meant that if you don't have the doctrine of justification by faith alone, you don't have the gospel. And if you don't have the gospel, the church has no reason to exist. The church itself ceases to be a church and falls into apostasy. But beyond the general ecclesiastical application there, Luther by extension would be saying that the doctrine of justification by faith alone is the article upon which you stand or fall, the article upon which I stand or fall. Again, why? Because it is the article that answers the question, what must I do to be saved? How a person gains salvation. The biggest problem that the human race has is this. God is holy. He's righteous. He's just. And we're not. And so the question of justification boils down to this. How can I, as an unjust person, have a right relationship with my Creator? A lot of people don't worry too much about that. They assume that God's kind of a celestial bellhop that's uh, ready to answer every one of our requests and that he has such an infinite mercy that he can just, just unilaterally forgive everybody of their sins and he doesn't need any process to take place in order to justify the ungodly. He's God. He can do what he wants to do. So why can't he just wave his hands and say, you're all redeemed. You're all forgiven. You're all saved. Well, he can't do that. Well, let me back up and say he won't do that because he can't do that. And he can't do that because he's God. 
because he's righteous. And the only way he could redeem people away from some process of justification would be for him to negotiate his own righteousness. And so, as Paul says in Romans, God provides a way of justification through Christ so that God may be both just and the justifier. God finds or has a way, doesn't have to find it, he eternally knows this way of justification by which he can maintain his own righteousness and yet redeem those of us who have no righteousness of our own. And so the debate here, again, centers on the question of how a person is saved. And that is not an irrelevant doctrine by any means. Calvin added his evaluation to Luther's by saying that justification is the hinge on which everything turns. Now, I've heard that metaphor used many, many times coming from the pen of John Calvin, and I think about it, and I think when he speaks about hinges, he must have had in mind the idea of some kind of a door, because we usually associate hinges with doors. Doors swing in and out because they are not affixed solidly to the frame, but they are on a hinge that allows them to turn in and out. And I can't help but jump from that to the many times our Lord himself used the metaphor of the door to speak of salvation. I am the door, he said, through which men must enter in order to come into the kingdom of God. And I think that was, was in Calvin's mind because when he talks about something being the hinge upon which everything turns, Calvin understood that the phrase justification by faith alone is simple shorthand for justification by Christ alone. And that was the issue at hand. Early Packer used a different metaphor. He, uh, in his introductory uh, uh, preface to the English translation of Athanasius' work uh, uh, on the Incarnation, Packer used the metaphor of Atlas, where Atlas had, was carrying the globe or the world on his shoulders. He said that justification by faith alone is the atlas of the Christian faith. If Atlas shrugs and that doctrine falls from his shoulders, all is lost. All other truths of the Christian faith perish with it. Now, some might look at these statements by Calvin and Packer and Luther and say, ah, this is uh, hyperbole. They're exaggerating the importance and there are those in our own day who, as I said, are saying that the Reformation is over. I've heard otherwise quite knowledgeable scholars say the oh, Reformation was simply a misunderstanding. I heard another theologian say it was a tempest in a teapot. In other words, no big deal. People got all exercised about this doctrine, got carried away with it, and mostly based upon miscommunication and misunderstanding, completely ignoring the multiple discussions and debates and attempts that took place in the 16th century to heal this rift and to heal this uh, breaking apart, leading finally to Regensburg, which we'll talk about later. But every effort at that time failed because the differences were not imagined. They were real. And they remain real even to this day, as we will see. Now, one last thing before I actually go into some of the historical background of this is that uh, even just this week, reading Facebook, and reading people's comments on social media, I heard or read at least three times statements by people 
who are saying that <clears throat> we are not saved by believing in doctrine. We're not saved by believing specifically in the doctrine of justification by faith alone. This particular critique, which I've read frequently in recent months, has been charged and leveled against uh, those who espouse what we call Reformed theology. And I just want to say, by inter way of introduction, in my life and teaching of over a period of 50 years, I've not one time ever heard a Reformed theologian or a Reformed person ever say that you're saved by the doctrine, by believing the doctrine of justification by faith alone. In fact, if there's anything that would refute the idea that you can be saved by believing in the doctrine of justification by faith alone would be the doctrine of the justification by faith alone. <laughs> because the doctrine of justification by faith alone precludes the idea that you could be saved by believing other and believing in Christ alone. It's not the doctrine that saves, it's the Christ who saves. And what the church is trying to explain in terms of the doctrine of justification by faith alone is to explain how Christ saves his people. And what we're saying is that justification is by putting our trust in Christ and in Christ alone, not in our theology textbooks, not in our creeds, as important as they may be, not in our confessions, but in our actual faith whose object is Christ, not the doctrine about Christ. You see the difference, I hope. Now, I often wondered myself, and I know for sure that no one is saved just because they affirm the doctrine of justification by faith alone. The devil knows that's true. But the other side of the coin is not so easy. What happens if you deny the doctrine of justification by faith alone? And that's a different matter because now you're denying that you're saved by Christ and by Christ alone. And that denial may be enough to damn you. That was believed by the Roman Catholic Church, as we will see, as well as the Protestants. Both of them believed that the doctrine of salvation was crucial for our uh, everlasting redemption. And what we believed about Christ was critical for ever. But uh, they also believed that the false teaching of it was worth damnation, as we will see when we look at the Council of Trent and also at Paul's letter to the Galatians. But by way of beginning our reconnaissance here over this doctrine of justification by faith alone, I just want to start off by saying that this was not a tempest in a teapot. This is very serious. And it's only in an age of unbelief in general that people begin to say that doctrine is not important. People who believe nothing are willing to negotiate everything when it comes to theology. But this theology defines the church's understanding of the gospel itself.